if you look historically since the podcast started, it's a topic that we get asked about an insane amount, which is the energy balance theory. And we've had tons of guests on who maybe have different opinions on this. It's something that you've written about a lot, but how do you think about the energy balance theory right now as it relates to the ranking system? Again, I put this right between promising and proven truthfully. So again, I think it's worth stating what we're talking about. So the energy balance theory, I believe would posit, and I, you know, again, I don't live in this world at the moment, so I want to be very sensitive to those who does, and I don't want to misrepresent it. So, uh, you know, if, if I am misrepresenting this, I hope I hear about it. Um, but you know, what it's basically saying is that the, um, that energy balance is determined solely by the caloric density of the foods consumed less the energy expenditure um and that the caloric density the net available caloric density of a food is its contribution to energy balance um now there so so this is where again i i feel a little bit bad talking about this because I haven't been as diligent as maybe I should be in staying up on this world over the past decade. I've, I've largely not paid attention to it truthfully um, because in many ways I've sort of seen what I believe is a reasonable answer, right? Which is, and, and, and just for folks who maybe don't know part of the history here, I mean, I was once running uh, an organization that funded research directly to try to answer this question. Um, and I think I went into that thinking the answer was going to be one thing, but actually very excited to see regardless uh, a swing at this. And and I think that that study, while it, it had some flaws, actually came out and showed something else, which was if indeed isocaloric manipulations of macronutrients change energy expenditure, it's not an enormous difference. What does that mean in English? If you give two people equally caloric diets that are radically different in macronutrients, do you have a significant difference in energy expenditure? That's what was being tested by that theory. And I think that the evidence is much more clearly in favor of the fact that no, you do not. Now, let's add, let's add a couple of caveats. There is clearly differences in the thermogenesis of food. So a thousand calories of protein, a thousand calories of fat, and a thousand calories of carbohydrates are going to have different processing amounts of energy that will result in different amounts of net available energy. Furthermore, different types of foods are going to differentially impact appetite. And therefore, in a free living environment, this isn't to say that macronutrients don't matter. Um, but what we're really trying to tease out is, you know, is there truly a scenario under which a person who's eating 3000 calories of a balanced diet can switch to 3000 calories of a ketogenic diet and have weight melt off them just because they're on a ketogenic diet, they somehow magically start burning a lot more energy. And again, I believe the answer to that question is no. I, I do not see any evidence to support that. And therefore, I think that if a person is on 3000 calories a day of a balanced diet, and they switch over to what they believe is 3000 calories a day of a ketogenic diet, and the weight starts pounding off them, I think they're either moving more or eating less than they realize. And what would you I've asked you this before, and I think it's applicable here, which is, how would you respond to people who maybe get frustrated at your ability to change your mind if new data comes out? Because I think, you know, you mentioned there, you could have people who came in maybe through the fasting content that we put out and was talked about, and now they're hearing this. And it's, you know, which is why I think, again, I like this ranking scale because it allows anchoring to things, which is, this is how I think about it. And this is our confidence interval. And this is, you know, how it could go up and down. But just in general, I think there may be at times in science, a, a resentment if you do change your mind. And I think that leads to potentially people sticking with their beliefs maybe longer than they should. 
And so how do you respond to people who say, you know, why do you change your mind? And should that affect what I hear you say today? I, so first of all, that's kind of news to me that people are upset about that. I, I would bet that it's not scientists who are upset at that. I think that any scientist who doesn't do that needs to be questioned, right? So in other words, if you can't change your mind in the presence of new data, I think by definition, you're not a science to, you're not a scientist, you're an advocate. Now, you know, advocacy has its place, but um, not without science. So I, I mean, the only thing I would ask of those people, if there are people that are indeed upset at me is, what would you propose as the alternative? Right? Like, is it is it is it vexing that I change my mind on things? Yes, I suppose it is. If it if it means that it impacts your, you know, belief about what is what is good to do, what is not to do. But if the alternative is I'm confronted with new data, but I ignore it or I pay attention to it and I lie about it, or again, I, I just can't I can't extract from that what the alternative is that is better than simply being uncomfortable with the fact that, yep, I used to believe this thing and I believed it and I lived it and blah, 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 blah. But now I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't believe it anymore. <laughs>